Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. On November 9th, 1984, New Line Cinema released one of the most important horror films of the entire decade. Nightmare on Elm Street. Ah! To say that A Nightmare on Elm Street was a success is an understatement. Besides getting initial positive reception, becoming a massive commercial hit, making back its $1.1 million budget in its first week, and finishing its box office run with $57 million worldwide, it cemented its director and creator Wes Craven as one of the biggest names in the horror genre. Craven himself, besides making a memorable film that has influenced future horror films, <laughs> He created one of the most recognizable horror icons in cinema, with the teenage killing dream invader Freddy Krueger. A new masterpiece in fantasy terror. And of course, the film's success ushered in a franchise, spinning from an initial seven-picture film series, television series, comic books, video games, a long-awaited crossover with fellow horror icon Jason Voorhees, a terrible remake. You open this door, Krueger! What do you think I did? I didn't do it again! And you guessed it, music made by everyone's favorite child murderer. Yes, Freddy's Greatest Hits by the Elm Street Group. The album is everything you expect it to be. Screaming 80s drum machines and distortion-filled electric guitars being drowned out by synthesizers. Forsaken by the answers that you seek. Now it's just you and me in this nightmare that is real. Over the top of these songs is Robert England doing the voice and manic laugh of Freddy Krueger. Yeah, right. For Nightmare on Elm Street collectors, Freddy fanatics, or lovers of everything oddball. Yes, the same year, the third movie, Dream Warriors, was released, and they had the American rock band Dawkin make a song for the new flick. Also titled Dream Warriors, it ended up being a commercial success for the band, peaking at 22 on the mainstream rock charts. Now, Dawkins' music video is rather interesting to watch, but that's not what we are talking about today. Mirror, mirror in my hand, who's the most gruesome dude in the land? This music video is going to be really interesting to talk about, primarily because it was involved with a lawsuit between New Line Cinema and its recording company. Yes, that is right. There exists a lawsuit involving a music video. And the musicians at the center of this? No, let me talk to you. Let me have a word with you. And if you with something else, I hope I'm not disturbing you. None other than DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And these two made a song whose music video you may have never seen before. A video that Smith described as the most incredible music video in history. So for this video, I am going to lay down the law, as it is once again music video time. And just in time for the Halloween season, today's history lesson is going to be centered on the scariest thing in the world. Louise! <laughs> Get ready for this one, as we are talking about A Nightmare on My Street. Oh, Mr. Kruger. <clears throat> Fred, old boy. Uh, have you heard about this new uh, Freddy Krueger movie, Nightmare on M Street Part 4, The Dream Master? With the critical and commercial success of Dream Warriors, New Line Cinema fast-tracked a fourth film in the series, Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. Now no one sleeps. In anticipation for the upcoming picture, New Line authorized two music videos to be made based on the flagship series. They were meant to be released in conjunction with the film's late summer 1988 release as a marketing tool. So just like using Dokken to make a song for Dream Warriors, Love Kills by the Vinnie Vincent Invasion was made, which showed clips of the fourth movie throughout. <laughs> With Love Kills appealing to fans of rock, New Line's other video they commissioned was to appeal to the 15 to 24 demographic that were into hip hop. Reportedly, 40% of the Elm Street audience at the time were black, and so they wanted to produce a rap music video as a way of giving back to this audience. I'm quoting what I'm reading in the lawsuit, by the way, which I am using as a source throughout this video. Read along if you are interested. As early as October 1987, New Line started looking for rap groups, talking with anybody that was independent at the time, and even contacting a rap agency. One of these groups that the production company asked was the Fat Boys. Yeah. 
Now the Fat Boys were a rap group first formed in 1983, consisting of Prince Marky D, Buff Love, and Cool Rock Ski. They were known for their comedic and self-deprecating songs, but also for their beatboxing. <laughs> The same year as the Dream Warriors were released, the Fat Boys released a cover of the Safari's Wipeout in conjunction with the Beach Boys. Yeah, this was riding off the success of Run DMC and Aerosmith's Walk This Way collaboration, though strangely, in this situation, both the Fat and the Beach Boys covered someone else's song, probably for the best anyway. <laughs> Anyways, Wipeout was a commercial success for the rap trio, peaking at number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100. The album it was based off of Crushing was also a commercial hit, peaking at number 8 on the Billboard 200 charts. Mm. The Fat Boys' commercial success would be a very viable choice for New Line to collaborate for the upcoming movie, so by December 1987, negotiations began between the production company and the Fat Boys' manager, Charlie Stetler. And the negotiations seemed to have gone well, as they were at the point of a written agreement being proposed. But during the search to find an act for this planned music video, over in the United Kingdom at Jive Records, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince were finishing recording their newest album. So here's a little something about my DJ. The magnificent. Jazzy Jeff. So busted. Created by childhood friends Jeff Allen Towns and Will Smith, this act was formed in 1984, becoming well known for having story-based raps as well as not using profanity in their songs. Listen, oh boys, don't mean to bust your bubble, but girls of the world ain't nothing but trouble. In 1984, their first single, Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble, saw some commercial success, peaking at 57 in the Hot 100. I was in a bar one Friday night. Really impressive feat considering Will Smith was still in high school at the time the song came out. The song also impressed Jive Records, who signed them onto their label, and in 1987, the duo's debut album Rock the House was released. The album was a success, eventually garnering gold status by the RIAA in 1988. After their debut, they started working on their second album, He's the DJ, I'm the Rapper. The album would lead to a commercial breakthrough for Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, thanks to the album's second single, Parents Just Don't Understand. You know, parents are the same no matter time, no place, they don't understand- Released on February 17th, 1988, it hit the top 10 on the hip hop charts and peaked at number 12 on Billboard, as well as having a popular video on MTV. Need to argue parents, just don't understand. The album ended up going triple platinum and the song won the first ever Grammy for best rap performance, beating out other acts such as LL Cool J and salt and Pepper. While an important achievement by the rap group, we need to go back a month before Parents Just Don't Understand was released to when Jive Records Vice President of Marketing Operations Barry Weiss contacted New Line Cinema with the prospect of having Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince make a song for the upcoming Elm Street film. In fact, they had already made a Nightmare on Elm Street song, having recorded it in the winter of 1987. Titled A Nightmare on My Street, the song pulls no punches in using the Elm Street identity, opening with a sample to Charles Bernstein's iconic theme song. Weiss would send a cassette tape of this track to Michael Harpster, the New Line Senior Vice President for Marketing. In March 1988, Weiss meets with New Line's Director of Licensing and Director of Music, Kevin Benson, to discuss the music video proposal. During this meeting, Benson lets Weiss know about the negotiations with the Fat Boys to do a song for the film. As mentioned before, a written agreement was proposed, but it was never finalized or even signed at this point. So there was still a chance for Jeff and Will to get signed on. By this time, Parents Don't Understand was a hit, and a song was already made based on New Line's IP, so all they had to do was make a music video. Benson himself was interested in having the duo for this proposal, and even suggested to Weiss to inform other members of New Line about the benefits of using the act. But eventually, Benson told Weiss that his proposal was financially unacceptable for New Line. Meanwhile, Weiss would not make any changes to his proposal, stalling to collaboration. The new album is called, He's the DJ, I'm the Rapper. Please welcome Jive RCA recording artist DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. By April 5th, He's the DJ, Aunt the Rapper would be released, and A Nightmare on My Street would be its opener. While the album became an immediate success for the rap group, New Line did not like this at all, seeking counsel for possible copyright infringement. And with that, New Line would choose the Fat Boys for their project. Which leads us to the Fat Boys' song for the Dream Master. Are you ready for Freddy? One, two, three, four, please put
To briefly explain its music video, it centers around Prince Marky being told that his uncle Frederick has died and was bequeathed him his house, with the stipulation that he has to spend a night in the house, which he and the other members of the Fat Boys do. Now Mark, the terms of your uncle Frederick's will state that you must spend one night in his uh, house in order to inherit his estate. Yo, let me ask you a question. Who is this Uncle Frederick anyway? Well, he's from a part of my family you never mentioned. I won't mention any of your family. <laughs> and once you know it, the house is on Elm Street. It's time for Freddy. Once they're in the house, they get terrorized by Freddy Krueger. Which is very odd considering the Fat Boys are very much awake the entire time. But overall, this is a pretty standard music video and the song for that matter. Probably the most interesting thing about it is you hear Robert Engling having a rap breakdown at the end. See, my name is Freddy and I'm here to say I'll rap you on the take away. In their contract, it was stipulated that in exchange for authorizing the use of the Elm Street themes and characters, New Line will share in the royalties earned by the Fat Boys' song and video. Reese would hear about this agreement on May 18th, to which he would send a memorandum to change their minds. In this memorandum, Weiss mentioned that MTV themselves was interested in doing a music video to A Nightmare on My Street. During a phone call between Weiss and Harpster, Harpster claimed that the Fat Boys' deal wasn't finalized and Harpster would get back to him. He didn't. Weiss was left out in the cold to the point of sending Benson a mailgram on June 15th for a response to his proposal, and if he didn't get an answer the following day, he would assume the deal with the Fat Boys was closed. Weiss would later get confirmation about the deal getting finalized in the June 25th issue of Billboard magazine. July 18th saw Weiss receiving a letter from Seth Willinson, Senior Vice President of New Line Cinema, informing him that New Line believed that A Nightmare on My Street infringed on their copyright. Willinson demanded that the records containing the song would be halted and to withdraw existing albums from the store shelves. One week later, New Line Cinema would claim copyright infringement against Zomba Recording Corporation, the owners of Jive Records, citing the Copyright Act of 1976, as well as the Lanham Act and the New York General Business Act. New Line sought both monetary damage and equitable relief. The next day, Zomba proposed including disclaimers on every CD, cassette, LP, single containing A Nightmare on My Street, informing customers that the song was not endorsed by New Line. The film company was not interested in working with Zomba about the disclaimer. Unbeknownst to New Line, during these two days, the music video to A Nightmare on My Street was being made. Okay. Here's the situation. And starting at the beginning of August, the movie company found out about the creation of the video and plans to broadcast it onto MTV. And with Elm Street 4 releasing on the 19th that same month, New Line went on the offensive. On August 12th, the film company began a motion for a preliminary injunction against the music video and sought a temporary restraining order to prevent the release and broadcast of the music video, which was deemed as unauthorized. While New Line was unable to get a restraining order, MTV was informed about the litigation and decided not to air the Nightmare on My Street video. In this case, New Line Cinema Corp versus Bertelsmann Music Group would proceed in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. The People's Court. Are you feeling tired yet? Well, you better prop open your eyelids with toothpicks, because Kevin isn't the only one I'm watching. This one should keep you up. <laughs> The case lasted for a couple months, with New Line Cinema ultimately winning the lawsuit. While the music group's defense was that they were protected under fair use to use elements and characters from the Elm Street series, the court decided otherwise. According to the court holding, the court ruled that defendant's use of Elm Street in the music video My Street was not fair use. The court found that defendant's music video existed solely as a video to promote the song, and defendants therefore stood to profit financially by using elements from Planet's films without making the usual licensing agreements before they produced their video. Next, the court found that Elm Street was a creative work of fiction or fantasy as opposed to a factual work, which weighed against a finding of fair use. The court then found that defendants had appropriated more of Planet's copyright protected works than was necessary for purposes of creating a purported parody, thus weighing against a finding of fair use. Finally, the court found that the My Street video 
if released, would likely harm plaintiffs' marketing for licensing Elm Street character and story elements in the music video market, and would directly compete with the Fat Boys video. While I can't find what exactly New Line got out of the ruling, DJ Jazzy Jeff would later say they had to pay New Line an undisclosed amount of money for damages. New Line, meanwhile, I guess in a form of an olive branch, offered to do our three-movie deal. Though according to Janet Grillo, junior exec of New Line, the deal was more of a pay us money or you will appear in one of our films. Now this was a take it or leave it deal and Will and Jeff didn't seem obligated to take New Line's offer, so they decided not to take the contract. But New Line still ended up making these movies, as what the movies ended up being was the House Party series. <laughs> If my pops finds out I got in trouble in school today, I'm definitely gonna be on punishment. This resulted in the 1990 comedy classic having Kid and Play take up the role of rapper and DJ. But if Jeff and Will did take the movie roles, not only would this have been Smith's first movie role, I'm fairly certain The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air would not have been made. Both works came out the same year, with House Party being released first. I would think the shooting schedule would have prevented Smith from ever attending a taping of the Arsenio Hall show, where he would have met Benny Medina, whose time living with a rich Beverly Hills family would be the loose basis of the TV series. A lot could have changed if these two Philadelphia musicians had taken this movie deal. Now here's the funny thing about this case. They were not allowed to distribute the music video at all. No airings on MTV, no video releases, no nothing. This video never saw the light of day because of this court ruling. It did nothing to stop the song itself from being accessible to the public. They didn't even remove the Elm Street theme song sample from the track. It was still the album opener to He's the Rapper on the DJ, and the single was still being sold at record stores and heard on the radio. All that happened to the song was a disclaimer sticker on the album saying, A Nightmare on My Street is not authorized, licensed, or affiliated with the Nightmare on Elm Street films. Otherwise known as the exact thing Zomba Recording wanted to do from the start. Now, you would think that without a music video during the heyday of MTV that this was going to hurt the music charting of Nightmare on My Street. You would be wrong. In in spite of the lawsuit, Jeff and Will's unauthorized song did incredibly well. As Jeff would say in an interview with the Boombox, radio stations at the time pit both their song and Are You Ready For Freddy in a contest to determine whose song was better. And it appeared the listeners preferred their song over the Fat Boys'. And it seemed very indicative to this claim as Nightmare On My Street was doing incredibly well on the charts, almost as well as parents just don't understand. On the other hand, Are You Ready For Freddy only reached number 93 on Billboard's R&B chart and never broke into the Hot 100. I did also see it peaked at 83 on the UK charts, but for only three weeks. That is a far cry from A Nightmare on My Street peaking at number 15 on the Hot 100 and staying on the charts for 16 weeks. And as a reminder, the New Line deal was that they were going to get royalties for both the Fat Boys' song and video. Comparing the commercial outcome of the two, it's clear that New Line Cinema backed the wrong horse. But despite appearing to be the winners in this musical war, the fate of the music video to Nightmare on My Street continued to have it be unshown to the public. Not one second of the music video had popped up anywhere in the decades to come, instead being just mentioned in footnotes about the song saying that the music video was still lost. In a March 2018 interview with The Boombox on the 30th anniversary of He's the DJ, I'm the Rapper, DJ Jazzy Jeff claimed that only 20 people in the world had seen the video. But Jeff did have a copy of the music video at one point. Unfortunately, his copy was taped over by soap operas by an old girlfriend. Will Smith also had a copy, but that too was misplaced after Will gave it to his father. And while I cannot verify this, there's a claim that one of the agreements in the settlement was for every copy of the music video to be destroyed. At this point, there was absolutely no hope that this music video would ever be found. And then something interesting happened. October 29th, 2018. The website MovieWeb published an article that showed the behind-the-scenes images of the production of A Nightmare on My Street. And for some, this would be the first time anything has ever been shown of what the video would have been. Given to the website by production designer Greg W. Harrison, some glimpses of the music video could be seen, such as a shot of Will Smith in his bed. But more importantly, we get the first ever image of what their Freddy Krueger looked like for the music video. Talk about trying their best not to infringe on copyright. This Kruger is pale, looks to be wearing a jacket and sneakers, and what appears to be a valve for an ear and a boombox equalizer in his left eye socket. Could have fooled me on first appearance. But why did these images pop up now in the first place? After 30 years, why would Greg Harrison only now release these behind the scenes images of a rather infamous production? And while I'm not entirely certain, 
it might have something to do with what happened a week before. On October 22nd that same year, a video was posted onto YouTube by an account named Nancy Thompson. They posted a video titled, Original Nightmare on My Street Music Video, with the description saying, I'm your DJ now, Princey. I'm your boyfriend now, Nancy. <laughs> and despite the tracking making it look like an analog horror film, this was not a Halloween prank. This was the actual music video. Now I have a story that I'd like to tell about this guy you all know me and we scared as hell. Albeit of low quality. A Nightmare on My Street was directed by Scott Calvert, who had also directed Parents Just Don't Understand. And both of these videos were made by Calhoun Productions, who also made music videos for New Kids on the Block and Pink Floyd. Doesn't seem to be much else known about them besides their IMDb page only listing eight works made by them. Along with tracking issues, the film was degraded and artifacts appeared throughout. And for some reason, it was taped over by an episode of Growing Pains for a second or two. That it would be groovy if we saw be that as it may, good news, the music video was found, but it was bad news as it looked like it was used and abused. But that's the interesting thing. This looks to have been a master tape to the music video. How on earth was it found? It's a question I doubt will be answered. For all we know, this was taken outside of a dumpster behind Jive Records. News picked up about the music video's surfacing, pointing out its low quality and referencing Jeff's remark about his copy being taped over. And that would have been the end of the story if further developments did not happen. On November 30th, on Jazzy Jeff's own YouTube channel, the music video was uploaded in higher quality. Now I have a story that I'd like to tell about this guy you all know me and we scared as hell. No more film degradation or tracking issues or Joanna Kearns. This was the complete version. And it is with this version of the music video, we can finally talk about what goes on in it. It has the same disclaimer that was used on the albums to let the audience know that they were not associated with the Elm Street series. Interestingly, the master tape version only has this disclaimer at the end of the video, but it was used at the beginning as well. It opens with Will Smith and friends checking up on Jazzy Jeff, who looks like he's been through hell. And from there, the song begins, and you get to see the entire story played out. This tells the story of how the two musicians and their friends go to see a movie. And something about Elm Street was the movie we saw. The way it started was decent, you know, nothing real fancy about this homeboy named Fred and this girl named Nancy. And because they were making an unauthorized music video, they didn't use any footage of the movie series while they are in the theater. I do wonder, though, if they made the footage for the video, or they took some things from an obscure movie. Let me know if you have the answer. But once Will Smith goes to bed, the true horror begins. Not I got home and laid down to sleep. That began the nightmare on my street. He raps about how he wakes up feeling extremely hot and gets threatened by Freddy Krueger. Walked in the house, the big bad fresh prince, but Freddy killed all that noise real quick. One thing I like about the design for Fred is that instead of a claw glove, they had one with record player arms on it. That's a really clever design choice. The souls of your friends, you and I will claim. You've got the body and I got the brain. You've got the body. I've got the brain. Eventually, he realizes it's all a dream, and like a Looney Tunes character, he is not threatened by Fred and just kicks him out of the house nonchalantly. On the shoulder said, thanks for stopping by. Then I opened up the door and said, take care, guy. But the dear fresh prince gets attacked by Fred, making him realize that he felt the pain. I drew back his arm and slashed my shirt. I laughed at first and thought, hold up, that hurt. And when all seems lost and the series villain is about to kill Will, he wakes up from his dream. But my alarm went off and then silence. It was a whole new day. And realizing his bed sheets were slashed, he immediately calls his DJ Jeff and tells him not to fall asleep, but overhears him getting slashed the bits. I'm your DJ now, crazy. <laughs> a bit of a dark ending for the group to make based on their output at the time, but seeing how they were making this to appear in one of the Elm Street films, they were committed. But word when it was over, I said, yo, that was death. While I don't agree with 1988 Will Smith calling it the most incredible music video, this is still enjoyable to watch. For it being shot in two days, it has a lot happening in it compared to the Fat Boys' video. As well, it's the funnier video of the two. Look, I'll be honest, man, this team won't work. The girls won't be on you, Fred, your face is all burned. Compared to the Fat Boys, whose video is basically the Three Stooges meet Freddy Krueger, <laughs> Nightmare on My Street does make use of dream sequences the series is known for, which again is really odd how Are You Ready for Freddy doesn't. None of the Fat Boys go to sleep in the video. 
They just enter the house and Freddy is in the real world. I don't understand how they just made it a generic haunted house story. That being said, comparing both the songs and music video, Jeff and Will made the better product. Every stretch of the way, Nightmare on My Street is better produced and has aged better than rapping Freddy. Stay ready, cause you know who's back. <laughs> Freddy. It's no wonder it was preferred by listeners at the time. And it's still really impressive they managed to crack the top 20 without a music video on hand. Which I do think that if there was a video, it would have been higher on the charts. But there's one thing that isn't exactly clear. Jazzy Jeff said he didn't have a copy of the music video, and yet somehow his YouTube channel managed to upload it a month after the first video was posted. Now granted, his YouTube channel is under Vivo, which I doubt Jeff has much creative control over. I'm guessing after the news broke that someone posted their copy, it showed interest that people did want to see the music video. Why wouldn't there be interest in an unseen 30 year old piece of media? But how was a clean copy of the music video found? Was the rumors that all copies being destroyed false? Or through some luck someone managed to have a copy and set in the motion to get it online? Could it have been Craig Harrison himself posting the video along with the images? Also, we have to wonder about the legality of the music video now. As of this recording, four years after release, it's still up online. Was there talks with lawyers and they had clearance by New Line to release the music video? Probably not. By the time it was posted to YouTube, it had been eight years since the Elm Street remake came out. For a company nicknamed the house that Freddy built, they stopped letting Freddy into their house. Which is more apparent now as the film rights to the Elm Street series was reverted back to Wes Craven's estate in 2019. And I'm guessing the Craven estate doesn't care about a three decade old music video. And I doubt we'll figure out how Nancy Thompson ever got their hands on the initial tape as they only posted one time on their channel. And even then, the video is currently blocked in the United States by Sony. And that was proof that there had been a nightmare on my street. A Nightmare on My Street is a very fascinating piece of music history. Its music video was made essentially in defiance of a film company's attempt to market to a young, specific audience. And even when the company successfully sued to have the video not be seen to the public, the song still ended up being more successful than the company's mandated song. And even more of a triumph, the video eventually appeared for the public to see after all these decades. And I'm glad to have watched it. It just goes to show that once again, companies just don't understand. Have a safe holiday, and, of course, thanks for your time.